Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Nice to see you all here tonight um, before the break. So thank you for coming. And we are really lucky to have with us um, tonight um, Rasa Schmitta and Raitis Schmitz, um, all the way from Latvia. So it's going to be a very special evening. Um, I hope some folks had a chance to participate in some of their events last week. Um, there was an event of uh, an, a talk and a screening of Atmospheric Forest uh, over in Media Study on Friday. And then this afternoon, uh, the virtual reality experience was also available. I just got to see it then. It's very cool. So um, you'll learn more tonight. But I hope uh, folks were participating in some of that. Um, so before I get into the fun part, a couple of housekeeping details. Um, as you know, um, everyone knows the attendance policy <laughs> at this point, but just to, I, I sent an email, but I wanted to reiterate that um, a hard deadline for any makeup work is the last day of classes, December 11th. So I know a few of you, we, we've been in touch about um, doing the makeup assignment to offset some absences. Um, do make sure to submit that to me by December 11th at the very latest, because then I'll have to put in grades. Um, if you can send it to me a little earlier, that is great. Really helpful in um, giving me more time to process it. All right, um, and details and instructions are in Brightspace in the module makeup assignment, okay? So be in touch with any questions. All right, um, let me start by saying that we would like to acknowledge the land on which the University at Buffalo operates, which is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. This territory is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, a pledge to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It is also covered by the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, which further affirmed Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty in the state of New York. Today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. Um, okay, so our speakers will be introduced tonight by Stephanie Rothenberg, who is the chair of our department and the area head of graphic design. So with that, I turn it over to Stephanie. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Rothenberg, and I'm the professor and chair in the Department of Art. And um, I'm super excited to have with us tonight uh, Raza Smita, who I just uh, always confused on the name, and Reita Smite. Um, as Becky mentioned, uh, they've been here for a few days, actually more than a few days, and we've had a really great time. Um, they've been touring Buffalo and the university and um, showed their atmospheric, uh, atmospheric forest project on Friday at a wonderful event. Um, so I'm also really honored that you both are here because um, they've been, uh, this duo has been at the forefront of innovative art and technology since um, the 90s. And they're based in Riga, Latvia, but also teach in Karlsruhe, Germany. But their work has extended not only in Europe, but globally, the, on an international um, scale. And they're not only talented artists, but they're also the founders of an extremely important cultural center that they co-founded in 2000, known as RICSI, which you could see over here, RIXC, which is the Center for New Media Culture um, in Riga, Latvia. And it hosts exhibitions, workshops, um, annual and art and science um, festival and symposium, and also a published journal called Acoustic Space. And so I first heard about uh, Raza and Raitis in 2004, when it was my first time going to this very uh, 
internet large global media festival called ISEA, the International Symposium on Electronic Arts. And it was also in, um, in Helsinki, Finland. But it was this kind of um, boat cruise where they took us, it started in Helsinki and it went on, I, I think almost like eight days, where they had all of these artists on this cruise boat that went all around into um, Estonia, uh, just really interesting, uh, Professor Paul Venus was there. And um, I heard about uh, these artists that were using an old Soviet radio telescope, a decommissioned former top secret telescope that was used by the military that was located in the forests of Western Latvia. So just to recap, um, in 1991, um, uh, Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia, the, um, these Baltic countries, um, became independent from Russia. So prior to that, they were within the Soviet Union. So all of these, all over the area, are all of these, um, you know, objects, relics from the Soviet Union. And so to, this was discovered in the early uh, 1990s. And, um, they turned it into a project when they were able to get access to it, and it was called the Acoustic Space Lab. And they started this in 2001, and they worked with artists and radio amateurs, community radio activists from all over the world to create, I guess what you could call a radio art astronomy. So this really kind of amazing project that was what I'm going to um, that's transdisciplinary, um, right? So this is something that's really important about their practice, is they're artists as researchers. So they're really working at this intersection of art, science, and immersive technologies. And they work with scientists, um, sociologists, creating visionary and interdisciplinary artworks that explore issues such as techno-ecological perspectives, human-plant communication, nature cultures, and a vast array of environmental climate topics. And in thinking about you know, the artist as a researcher, um, Raza holds a PhD in sociology. Uh, Radis has a PhD in the arts. Raza uh, teaches, she's a professor and um, the head of the Media Art and Creative Technologies program in the Paja University, and also a senior researcher at the Basel Academy of Art and Design in Switzerland. And Reitis in 2017, they've spent some time in the US. Um, he was a Fulbright researcher at the Graduate Center at CUNY in New York City. And they've also both been um, lecturers at MIT and the Art, Culture, and Technology program, which is in Boston. And I was able to meet them in person through a really uh, wonderful initiative that was with um, uh, the Baltic states and also um, a Nordic Norwegian uh, initiative called Renewable Futures that went from about 2015 to 2020. And it was a way of bringing together um, artists, uh, scientists, uh, the culture industries, also sustainable businesses to really rethink um, our, you know, kind of ecological crisis that we've encountered. Um, so they're going definitely to be talking about the atmospheric forest, and I hope that um, several of you were able to try it this afternoon in the computer lab, but also some other projects that I've been really fond of. Um, there's a project called Biotricity, and it's a real-time visualization and sonification of bioenergy. So that means that they created a battery, a bacteria battery, a microbial fuel cell, where the electricity is generated by microorganisms that are living in the mud. And then the fluctuation of bacteria electricity gets interpreted into real-time stereo sound structures. And then this project evolved, which I'm sure they're gonna show you, into this other really wonderful project called Pond Radio where these fuel cells were um, installed in a giant pond and um, micro radio transmitters were powered from the electricity that was generated by the fuel cells in the pond. And their artworks have been exhibited um, at 
you know, all over the world um, in so many different venues, um, but in some really uh, high profile, uh, well-known uh, media festivals, but also international festivals such as the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2018, um, media art centers such as uh, ZKM, uh, which is in Karlsruhe, Germany, and that was started by Peter Weibel, who um, unfortunately just passed away, but had been here at Buffalo and was part of um, the uh, legacy of the Department of Media Study. Um, HEK, which is the House of Electronic Cultures in Basel, Switzerland. Um, Ars Electronica, which is a big international festival of art and technology in Linz, Austria the Beijing Art and Technology um, Biennial, and then uh, just recently, Onyx Studio in New York City, which is a new uh, media art space right in the city, and also they were in an exhibition up at OCAD, uh, up in Toronto. Um, and also just to note that uh, in 1998, they uh, won the Prix Art Electronica Award, and they were also more recently nominated for a Falling Wall Science Breakthrough um, in 2021. So I'm really excited that they're here and able to share their work with you. I think it's uh, gonna be very interesting if you're not familiar uh, with this kind of work. So if you could please join me in welcoming Raza and Reitis, uh, that'd be great. Are they on? Yeah. Or is it just no, it's not. Hello, uh, thank you very much, all of you, for coming here. We are excited to see so many uh, people. Um, also, thank you, very, thank you very much for inviting us, Stephanie, and our department. Uh, also, we have been around uh, to see many other places. Thank you all the colleagues of our department and also of media studies department and also students whom we visited today in their studios. So we have been really spending um, a wonderful time here. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Stephanie, for an amazing introduction. So, well, I can reduce my introduction. <laughs> Thanks, you. Um, yeah, so good. Let's uh, have a first slide, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, uh, we have a, this interdisciplinary background with right? It's like also Stephanie already mentioned. For example, um, I have my master's in, a, in a visual arts, but also we have been uh, like internet radio pioneers since working like mid 90s. And, uh, and, uh, but but uh, also my PhD is in sociology. So what was my interest in combining these because I also wanted to learn to work with the data, and so that's what I also uh, still do also in uh, uh, our, my artistic practice. Uh, so Raitis has also a very extensive like curatorial practice, and also his he has his PhD thesis was about um, how to preserve, save, um, renovate, and and um, represent new media art artworks. So all this, uh, all this, our experience also have been, um, uh, we have been putting into, into both into our artistic practice as well as in our uh, centers, uh, RICSI activities. And um, so gradually, so we have been also following all the stages uh, of new media, how they have been evolving from the internet to, to, to locate your media, location-based uh, practices, and later to completely like re nearly re replacing this virtual era with mobile paradigm. And uh, later, about since about 2009, we are particularly working with the topics of, uh, com uh, of, co of uh, how to find rela relations between um, 
ecology and technologies, ecological topics and technologies, biology and computing, and also addressing climate change and renewable energy topics. Uh, so, what? Uh, uh, the big, so also we are we annually organizing Rixi festivals. So in 2019, uh, just before COVID, so we had a really large edition of the festival. So it was, uh, so I, there were about like 25 artworks exhibited and it was in National Art Museum, which is in Riga, which was recently renovated. Uh, and also we were hosting conference of nearly 150 people coming from all over the world, from about like 60 universities and 30 countries. And, uh, and also this exhibition was, um, was also visited by about like 20,000 people, so which is in, small, in Riga, which is a uh, size of uh, half million city, was quite, quite also a big number. So this is how we gradually have been also um, bringing these discourse, uh, discourses uh, into the, for the wider public. Okay, so yeah, we are organizing, um, yeah, different events. We have been, uh, um, these are the festivals from all, all during the COVID time, so there also was a, uh, uh, Adams Brown performance from Michigan University. There has been also, uh, this year we exhibited European media artworks uh, from the uh, project, pro bigger platform in Europe, which is producing especially new media artworks. Uh, it's called MAP MR platforms. And then we also have a, are collaborating, collaborating locally with, uh, because Rixi has a, we are running small gallery, but we are collaborating with uh, this is a very new modern uh, national library building. They have exhibition halls there. So we are organizing projects there. Then we collaborate with Contemporary Art Center, Kim uh, in, uh, in, in Riga, and also with, uh, with uh, also the, the National Museum. And um, so we are also uh, carrying out the projects, um, curating, yeah, like I said, we are curating. So we are curating also, uh, like for example, this augmented reality art project where we were involving also students, our former students from Karlsruhe, from, uh, from, uh, and from Latvia, from Liepāja University where I teach. Um, yeah, so, and the, this is the, the recent edition which was called Crypto Art and Climate. Yeah, so and that's our small gallery, and here we are also showing different artworks. So this, for example, is what already Stephanie mentioned. So this is our uh, biotricity uh, bacteria battery work. Maybe right, this you have small. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Hello, hello, uh, everybody, and uh, I'll just take it from Rasa for a little while here. Uh, we will. Is it? Yeah, is it on? Uh, we will not show in detail our uh, bacteria uh, battery and biotricity project, uh, but it has uh, quite a few versions and uh, quite a few outcomes. So uh, maybe I'll just tell uh, a little bit about it, so how we started. We, mm, somehow it has turned out, it wasn't kind of really our uh, sort of goal, but uh, Throughout our practice, we've been collaborating with different scientists for quite a long time. And this was one of the collaborations where we initially, we had a different idea. We had an idea so that we need some kind of a power source, which, wouldn't, which is natural, but it's not in wind or solar, which could be used to power uh, very small electronics for our kind of uh, new project. And some of our uh, friends introduced us with biologists, uh, with local biologists in Riga. And they, so we just came together and they uh, showed us this technology, and that was like 15 years ago, uh, which is called microbiofuel cells. If you Google it now, like MFC, so you'll find, so there are quite a few researches going on, especially in the US, in the universities, so where they kind of do research how to apply this technology to different applications like purifying water, also creating uh, a little bit of power. So it doesn't create much power. So, and because of that, so it didn't work for our project, but we got really interested in the technology itself because it's, uh, on the one hand, it's kind of, you can make it uh, very uh, 
scientifically sophisticated by using different materials and cultivating different kinds of bacteria. But on the other hand, so everybody of us could do it, so uh, because it's on a basic level, it's very simple. And we did a lot of workshops with, with friends, with artists, with students, also with the kids. Kids love it very much. And, and so you can do it like when, when you prepare the kits, so you can actually create these uh, MFCs maybe in a couple of hours or so. It takes a little bit more time for them to start producing uh, electricity, but otherwise it uh, goes pretty kind of straightforward. So we got interested in that, in that whole process, and also because there is this bacteria, so this is the organism which is kind of it draw our imagination. So it's one of the oldest organisms on the planet, so uh, it kind of, it's also in our bodies, it's uh, everywhere, so and if we will die, probably it will stay after us. So uh, for us, it was interesting to kind of be engaged on that sort of a level, imaginative level with the bacteria. So, and we built these sets uh, with bacteria cells, so this is one of them. So where uh, they, while well, they're producing this very low voltage uh, power, each cell produces about half a volt, maybe up to one volt power. Uh, in amperage, it's very small. We talk about milliamps, so that's why you need more than one cell to power something, like a watch or something. And we use that uh, electrical current uh, for sonification in the beginning, and then we also used it for, for uh, visualization as well. So it was kind of combination. So, uh, and then as I said, so there were different outcomes. Uh, at one point, uh, we thought, okay, so we can make it in, in our studio and we can put it in a gallery. So it's a kind of gallery size sort of installation. But then uh, our biologists said that they should work also in open air. So they should work maybe if you just put it in the ground. We didn't do that, but we tried to put it in a pond. And in a pond, so you just simply use two electrodes. One you put on the bottom of the pond, another is floating on the surface and then you wire them and you take wires out uh, from a pond and then yeah do whatever you want with that power so we built uh, these open air sound installations multi-channel sound installations technically it's done that there's actually in between there's some electronics it's used arduino for instance you can use which converts the analog signal from coming from uh, bacteria cells into the digital uh, stream, and then the digital stream, obviously, you can uh, either sonify or visualize, so depending on your goals. So throughout the process, yeah, uh, we kind of realized that combination, like working with scientists, it's what, what interests us. So, but uh, as you see I, here also, we put this uh, quote by Naum Gabo, which is the old quote already. Uh, and he has worked with uh, science as well, so when he was creating his sculptures. And I like very much the approach that he's emphasizing, especially for us artists, it's important that we can kind of get to know certain science discoveries. We can get to know scientific processes, but we need to have our own vision to take it further and to create an art project out of it. So not just become kind of illustrators for that or another uh, scientific uh, process, but have our own vision and have our own concept and, and bring it out of the lab and create an artwork with, with the vision of our own. So, and yeah, so this is uh, another uh, American artist who was working at MIT uh, at the time and uh, had this like also be involved in, in the uh, art and science collaboration. So where the artist could be uh, extra eye to the scientists and engineers in a way. Uh, I would say also kind of extra uh, imaginators maybe uh, to, to all the rest uh, of the public. So, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, and Stephen Wilson, yeah, uh, just, yeah, I just put those quotes for kind of, which inspire us, and maybe it's also inspiration for, for you who work uh, in the in realm of technology and, and also science and art. So, 
Steven Wilson uh, is also a legendary person and I recommend he has written this book, it's almost like encyclopedia, uh, which, where he kind of goes through all different kinds of art projects which are related to technology and it's called Information Arts. So it was published a while ago uh, by MIT Press and uh, he has unfortunately passed away already. But uh, he has done, like one of very few artists and theoreticians who has done this sort of uh, encyclopedic kind of uh, review of so many artworks which are uh, dealing with uh, science, technology, and art as well. So uh, we go swap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and um, yeah, uh, as um, Stephen Wilson was saying, so. He thinks, and I also think so, that um, scientists should, should be really interested and keen on what's happening in the science and so and technologies, and also scientists actually has to follow what's happening, what are the most new ideas or what's topical uh, into the art, because this definitely this collaboration could could bring a little bit different perspective maybe to the many of the topics which uh, we don't know how to solve if, if we are working on just in a single discipline. Okay, and here uh, about this um, creative arts, which is an experiential practice. This is, this is also our approach, how we, how we work with the uh, scientific tools and data and also our remote sensing tools in particular. So our atmospheric forest, uh, this is the uh, project which we were working, uh, which is a part of a a bit larger framework of a research project called Eco Data, Eco Media, Eco Aesthetics. And this was uh, funded by Swiss National Science Foundation. And the main idea of that project was uh, to find out uh, how art can use scientific tools, scientific data, and media, which, which are used in science, in order to, to better understand and uh, become aware of ecological uh, issues. And here we've had a special site, a collaboration with uh, Swiss climate and forest scientists uh, who, were, uh, who were setting up like a living laboratory in a Swiss alpine forest. This is really like a very old forest, which is dying out because of a drought. It's suffering uh, quite heavily. And scientists were carrying out there like for two decades uh, the experiment, which they were irrigating certain plots artificially and some plots they were uh, like monitoring, uh, which were like very dry areas. So for uh, about 10 years, they were carrying out this one project, uh, really like marking and measuring shrinking trees and also growing uh, species uh, which are new there uh, and also measuring uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the different, uh, these volatile gases which are coming which trees are emitting, and this is where we are coming. So this were the scientists also on Friday, we were showing this, uh, what they are saying, because I was interviewing them, uh, also, also asking for to give uh, their feedback about what they think about collaboration with artists. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, why working with scientific uh, instruments, one of them, most important probably is really to go myself into these forests uh, to, to find out what is happening there. Maybe even not, nothing special is happening there. But once I met this, uh, the scientist who was a young Finnish scientist and she was, uh, she was a resident uh, a scientist, I think she was a PhD student that time. Uh, she was from Finland, but she was in this uh, Swiss forest bringing this equipment which they are measuring uh, the volatile em organic compounds, yeah, uh, volatile emissions which are coming out of the trees, which are recognizing as a fragrant, uh, fragrance of the pine trees, for example. And so, so since we were looking for this um, link, because we have been always working with the visible properties of different of the medium technology, but also of the other physical worlds. So we were also always interested to think how um, this. Uh, uh, forest ecosystem, how it relates to a uh, much larger landscape, uh, especially air, atmosphere, and maybe even how far it can go up if up uh, and into relations with the sky, for example. And uh, learning from these scientists, 
uh, we just realized, you can go next, yeah, we just realized that this is exactly what is happening. I was, in the beginning I was thinking, okay, I have, we have worked with uh, electromagnetic signals previously, we have worked with bacteria, electricity, impulses also previously, but, 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 atmos but something like atmospheric chemistry or plants chemistry was something really new for us. But then we learned, learned really exciting things about it, which we didn't know. Um, we, didn't, we didn't think that uh, also trees are breathing, and that actually the tree, which means that they're literally also releasing, uh, they're not only pro producing oxygen, but they are also releasing uh, some CO2 back into the air, sometimes quite a lot, maybe especially in the nighttime, about sometimes even 20%, and scientists can't really explain the need for it, for it. maybe it's too much of the CO2 for them to consume and that's why they do it. But also the scientists, because they, they, it's very difficult for, to measure these volatile emissions, the fragrancy, yeah, they, they, because they, it takes just a minutes and, and hours and they are already so far, so far away and all around uh, us and about around the forest and uh, these uh, volatile emissions also take a, take a part in, in forming the clouds. Uh, so, which means that they definitely should have some interaction with the climate also globally in, in a longer term, but, which, but how, it, it is still uh, quite unknown for the scientists and they have very different opinions about it. Some think, some are convinced that this uh, really nice, uh, strong fragr fragrancy in a hot summer day will help, it means that uh, forests are are dealing well with this stress, how they call it, because of the drought and the heat. But uh, some other scientists are th saying it's not so easy and they think it, it may be even do it otherwise because these volatile emissions very quickly can join also to the pollution of uh, anthropogenic uh, different sources like cars, pollutions and creating aerosols and actually contributing to the pollution. So from all this uh, science part, so we will uh, let the scientists do their job, but, uh, but I understood the situation is very complex uh, and uh, that there is something we should do about this complexity. One thing, first thing was uh, that I wanted to understand myself what means this same molecular formula, so which is resin production, resin, which is uh, trees are producing inside of them. And then also, uh, also, that this, that how they said that they, they are, of course, uh, emitting this uh, through the bark of the trees. They are uh, responsible for this uh, smell, but uh, of the forest is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but then, uh, then also they say, but uh, that's the same. Uh, you can make out turpentine of it if you are distilling, and you can also burn it into colophonium. So that's what I did. I transformed it into like a more tangible experience, uh, a performance. Uh, so which I did in a first in my countryside. First one took five hours, but then later I, I, I reduced it into about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I could present in some exhibition openings as well. So this is. Uh, I was very happy to get out some drops of turpentine, just in very very simple distillation process on a hot tube. Uh, burning and melting the resin and pouring cold water on it. Yeah. So, yeah, to, to continue with atmospheric work, so atmospheric forest work, uh, <clears throat> first thing which Russell already showed, uh, it was very kind of important for us and I also encourage you uh, to actually get your, get your hands on and work with the real materials. So for us it was important. We, we work mostly with digital uh, media. But in this case, first we wanted to actually touch and, and, and see how it feels. And that's why we went through this kind of process of melting resin and, and uh, distillating it and then and, and getting out different substances of the uh, pine resin. So uh, then, of course, we came back to the actual uh, idea how we kind of could proceed with the work. And in the beginning, and someone asked us today, so also, uh, did we have kind of idea uh, when we started to collaborate with scientists? So uh, 
most of the times we don't have an idea in the very beginning. So we just meet with them, we talk about the subject, we talk about the research they do, then we go back, overthink it, then we go back and meet with them again, then we explore the site or, or think about it, read about uh, some stuff, and then uh, on the end, so it all comes kind of together also when we start using uh, specific technology or specific tools. Like in this case, uh, it started with the LiDAR scan. Uh, Rasa got the opportunity to use this very uh, high-end uh, LiDAR scanner, which has high resolution and, and reaches like about 100 meters distance. And she took it to the, this forest and started to scan those sites. So as you saw before, so there was this graph, so which was kind of uh, natural, uh, naturally grown trees and the other trees which were artificially irrigated. So uh, in that sense, we already had this idea so that we need to structure somehow the work. And so we have to take those scans from those particular sites, from those particular places, because we're going to be working and talking about them in our work. So, and then she brought back these scans, and those scans looked uh, very photorealistic. Uh, there were lots of points in those scans, and they were kind of looked uh, good by themselves. And those are 3D objects, so those are not the pictures, so it's a 3D object. So uh, when we re reduced the points, the point, point uh, count in those scans, uh, mainly for two purposes, for aesthetic, for visual aesthetic purpose, and also we wanted to reduce the file size to, to work with. So then from there, we immediately understood so where we should go, in which direction we should go with the work. So, so we decided so that it has to be a visualization, and it just crashed. But no, it didn't. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we decided, yeah, so that we're going to use those scans with very reduced uh, points. And we're going to visualize data uh, by using uh, small particles, uh, small points, and, and each of those uh, particle clouds represented different kinds of data. So altogether, there are uh, six data sets, and the whole work is kind of built in a way so that there is, we call it a structure, and then we call it a processes. The structure is uh, represented by the actual scan of the forest, or different places in a forest, and that's the 3D object, obviously. Uh, and the processes, Processes are the data sets, basically the CSV files with lots of numbers. So, and the whole data sets I, I didn't mention, it's one growing season, it's six months. So, and uh, data sets uh, are, are the, the processes are visualized by using uh, Perlin script with, with those particle clouds. Uh, and it's all put together in, in a Unity software. So, uh, yeah, here you can see also the uh, part of the processes, uh, those who can have experienced the work, so they can see uh, these uh, little particles flying around. So the orange ones, uh, those represent the uh, resin pressure in the tree trunks, which scientists are measuring constantly. Then there's kind of clouds, bigger clouds around each of the tree. Those represent the volatile emissions. Uh, on the ground, so you see the circles and, and, and those shapes uh, filled with those particles represent the soil moisture. The same is in the sky or similar, so uh, which is the uh, air humidity. And then the actual structure represents two other data sets, which is day-night cycle. It gets bigger, uh, it gets <laughs> brighter and darker. And the air temperature, uh, and the air temperature, which is simply uh, also visualized by using color. So, in, in, in when it's cooler, uh, it becomes kind of bluish, and when it becomes really hot, sometimes the forest can get really red. Uh, all the other time, it's something in between. So, the work is built in a way that uh, it's all Unity app at the end. It's a built, but. Uh, then these are five scenes, which I'll come back 
to them later, not later, but right now. Uh, but uh, the actual work, uh, yeah, uh, the five scenes uh, which represent the first scene represent trees, tree, three trees which are growing in natural environment. So then the second scene is actually representing the whole site and the pathway to the site. So it goes along the canal. The uh, third scene, it's uh, irrigated site with three trees uh, with, from irrigated site. In the fourth scene, we took away structure. We took away structure and we just left uh, pure data and uh, small particles uh, with the resin pressure and, and the soil humidity and air humidity as well. So it's just, uh, just the data and just the processes there. And then the fifth thing is kind of everything together, both sides with the structure and with the whole data. Uh, it also has a sound, and the sound is uh, actually composed particularly. Uh, it's, it's not a sonification. We have sometimes for other work sonification, but for this, this work we kind of felt that there is already enough with the visualization and we thought we need to kind of compose sound. So we composed the sound for each particular scene uh, according to what is kind of happening there and according to our, how we feel it. However, we used uh, samples which we recorded in that particular forest and also sound samples which we recorded while Rasa was melting the resin, while, while she was kind of having this fireplace and, and, and uh, crickling sounds from, from the fireplace and also the resin melting process. Then it was kind of post-process uh, uh, in, in a sound software and then we yeah, just did the composition for the whole piece uh, together. Uh, it has, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's now, are you going to play it? Or you how we? Play. Yeah, I will play it. Mm -hmm. uh, it has several formats, so just talking about practicality. <laughs> but maybe it's good for you to know sometimes, <laughs> so behind the scenes. So we were commissioned to do it for a large exhibition, Critical Zones in ZKM. And uh, that was supposed to open right in the middle of COVID lockdown. So they couldn't open the exhibition, but they Kind of it was scheduled, so they decided to open the exhibition, but virtually. So they asked us to have a, uh, something for virtual exhibition, which will be over the internet. And then P Peter Weibel at that time still uh, was around, and he said uh, this nice quote, which I like to mention. He said that the museum has become a television. And it was really set like that. So, and uh, we created this 360 uh, video just for the internet, and it's still available, so uh, from ZKM site, you can navigate zkm.de and search for critical zones exhibition, virtual exhibition, and it's there. But uh, then they opened it uh, after a half a year or so, they opened the real exhibition, and initially we saw that we're gonna make it just for VR, but the VR was not allowed because of hygienic blah, 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 and, and, and uh, lockdown and COVID. So they said you have to, if you want to show it, you have to do something else. You have to make a projection. So we decided not to go with a single channel. We decided to do a, a dual channel projection just to give, give a bit more immersion for the audience. So, and then there is this dual channel projection, which kind of works well and has been exhibited since then uh, together with virtual reality work. So, and then, of course, there is a single channel as well. So, and there are these, these like practicalities. So because virtual reality work is not interactive, so we were able to create a video out of it, which is rather, I say, it's a good practice because the virtual reality work will, be, will have to be rebuilt after a certain while if you want to kind of experience it after, I don't know, 10 years from now, it will definitely not work because it's built for this particular equipment for HTC Vive and who knows what will be after 10 years. So, so therefore the video will last as long as we know the video as such. So it's a good kind of practice to put everything also on a video. So however it kind of silly might sound. But uh, definitely virtual reality can be restored after a while. And uh, for instance, there is a, a virtual reality work by Char Davis, so which has been restored recently. 
uh, and which was done in, back in the 90s, mid-90s. So, uh, yeah, Let's show. we can show maybe a little bit uh, from the, it's, yeah, it still <laughs> have time. So this will be uh, from the one channel video which we also screened here and we'll show maybe a little bit from that, the first part. Okay, so, and um, this uh, atmospheric forest, as Wright said, was, um, it was uh, produced and commissioned for uh, critical zones. The exhibition, which was curated by Peter Weibel and also French philosopher, philosopher Bruno Latour. And, uh, and uh, so since, uh, since, he, they, uh, since Bruno Latour is actively always inviting uh, us to um, 
like go back to the earth, you know, like the, the, his book down to earth, uh, and and also all the critical zones. This is the the concept which they both developed together about this uh, very tiny uh, tiny layer around the, this our blue planet. Yeah. So actually, all life is happening, and this is just a really like a few hundred kilo, one hundred kilometer up and down and that's it so nothing else no, nowhere else the life is happening so they were really pointing uh, our attention to it and they were also using similar uh, similar um, s s science ob science these living laboratories uh, observ observatories how they call it yeah so which more and more recently also science critical zones actually is the um, the term which uh, scientists invented, climate scientists, who are really trying also to, to show all these um, relations into the ecosystems which is happening. So, but this is all about this, because we, we didn't, uh, then we recently also were commissioned by our contemporary art center who, who were making um, uh, a, a project, bigger project European about post-social ecologies. So, and we think, we were thinking, well, we, of course, we, we, we love to work with the climate and ecology on Earth, but still we always have this our um, earlier interest also alive. Why? Why we still need this, uh, this uh, radio telescope and interest uh, with, uh, with this um, inter amazing object like a 32 meter antenna. So that's also what, uh, so we thought, okay, let's, let's do this. Uh, ecological project, but let's try to understand all these relations. So why, why socially or culturally or artistically, we, we, we are so excited about uh, when we see this very old technology, like from 1970s, like really like this probably was spying Norwegian some, or, or Swedish submarines, but it was also uh, the other similar um, antennas were also like uh, yeah, t receiving first signals from first sat satellites or maybe first uh, man in a, in a universe. So, um, so we, we were kind of revisiting uh, with, with also using new technologies, uh, with uh, drones and, and lidars and, and, and uh, photogrammetry. So uh, we wanted to, to see how with the eyes of today, with all the ideas of today, uh, also about the relations, about the climate, also because it's a 21st century that definitely is not so big space uh, imaginations and the expectations maybe that as it was in the 20th century, at least for space conquest. So we, uh, we revisited this project uh, and we did um, another new visualization. So what this slide which right this is now showing, these are from the older work, maybe you can show briefly this video. So, so this was the video which we did about 20 years ago. Hmm? Yeah, no, I just stopped it okay. to, to tell about it. So, uh, yeah, this is from, which Stephanie mentioned already in 2001, we did this uh, symposium at the site of radio telescope and uh, our we just recently been discovered discovered this radio telescope that that, that such an exists in Latvia, and some other friends of ours, filmmakers, photographers, also be discovered it and and when there just it's huge antenna and it's very impressive and you can kind of photograph it or film it. Our uh, kind of uh, goal was uh, not so much to kind of picture uh, or or film it. However, we did it now. Uh, two years ago, but first we wanted to use it as a tool. So just to get an idea, if we can use it as a tool to receive signals and get those signals uh, to use for sound art. And scientists helped us kind of to, to build very dodgy kind of equipment uh, to step down the frequencies and to make them audible. And that was all kind of done in, in a period of these 10 days. And, uh, but uh, we came also after the project, so we decided, so it was such many things there, so we uh, decided to do a, uh, also a DVD out of that. So, and DVD has two parts. One part is about history of the telescope. The other part is actually about this uh, sound art symposium. So uh, I'll play just a little bit maybe yeah. uh, from this first part.
not many things have changed, though. If you go there, it still looks very similar to this, so. Except antenna is renovated. Antenna is, uh, yeah, reconstructed. In the forest of Western Latvia, in Yevonet, near Ventspils, are located the Soviet-era 32-meter fully steerable parabolic antenna, RT-32, and the 16-meter diameter antenna, RT-16. So, but it's not, it was, it's not like we haven't been there these 20 years. We have been also doing different other projects time to time again. Is there is new ideas or new technologies, next new technologies were there. For example, uh, in this area to receive the signals from the universe. Uh, so it's not allowed even to uh, have mobile phones really on. So it's, it really has to be around uh, 10, 15 kilometers radi radius. There has to be complete silence. So today, they have optical lines coming from Ventspil 30 kilometers long, uh, but, that, but, but in about 2005, 2006, uh, they didn't. But uh, it was a time when finally mobile phones were quite good also to send the signals. So once we organized uh, the performance, we were, uh, uh, there was a huge, huge small setup, <laughs> but it was huge because we were performing um, how this antenna is receiving the signal from four different celestial bodies. So at, we started performance at 8 p.m., for example, uh, with the first half an hour signals from Venus. 8.30, we switched uh, the antenna to the next destination, to Sven constellation or something, and then, uh, and then again to the, to the Jupiter, which was just showing up a, a, a little bit above the horizon. And, uh, and we were transmitting this via mobile signals into the internet. And the other team of, uh, of Latvian sound artists uh, in Dortmund, there was an exhibition with also our installation of open, called Open Sky together with uh, other co collective from New Zealand who are working with radio astronomy. And so they were performing like live performance with these signals. So we did these uh, setups uh, those times. But now when we went back, so I said that our interest was ecology. So we where like uh, already we meet uh, different people there. It's already younger generation, uh, much more enthusiastic, much more open-minded, and they, are de they were so happy about artists because they were thinking that we can do something together. We were even surprised ourselves. So that they wanted to, uh, to, to share their data. They just were asking which ones you need. So, um, and then we were asking, like, kind of giving them this idea, like, similarly with, uh, with bacteria, but we sometimes were encouraging a little bit to the scientists to go out themselves and to put, like, this natural environment, bacteria, batteries out there, not only in their laboratories. So here we also were asking what, 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 what this guy would, would say, he's a quite young uh, radio astronomer, what they would say about if they would collaborate with Earth scientists with, like, meteorological data. And, uh, and they would uh, use AI tools and, and different other tools like to, to have this understanding how solar 
um, radiation is affecting ionosphere, for example, and how this signal uh, is interacting with winds and the Earth. So this was also, then he said, yeah, that could be quite interesting. So he happily provided us with these data so we could again show this only the complexity, not, not really the solutions, not really what, what, how they really affect uh, all these uh, layers, um, uh, each other, but yeah, maybe. But it's yeah, maybe <clears throat> uh, just uh, as Ras said, so we had this uh, opportunity to do, to make, a, not to continue with it and to create another work uh, using radio telescope and, and data provided uh, by scientists uh, uh, about solar activity and uh, ionospheric uh, changes in ionosphere because sun, sun affects it. So we thought uh, how and what we're going to do it so and uh, we saw that this time we actually need the actual telescope as an object. So I just put here like for practical reasons to show that there are some we did some uh, rough photogrammetry with drones, so because it's like 20 meters high. No, 70. So, uh, 70. Oh, yeah. So, so it's, it's quite, quite a work. So and you need actually to have it more detailed. You need maybe 10 times more pictures. So, but as we said, we saw we're going to use it as a point cloud. So we will just we be enough in our case uh, for, for the, uh, our needs. So uh, we built a model uh, in, in, in point clouds and then we uh, visualized this model using the data sheets, what they provided. So, uh, and there are two kinds of work. So where in, in one version, the uh, data is just sonified and the telescope is rotating and uh, the camera movement is pretty constant. Uh, and the other work is where actually we have larger immersive installation where we have also sonified data and we have also controlled uh, camera movement and by the data sheets and also controlled uh, uh, different uh, effects which are uh, applied to those uh, particular scenes. So uh, I will yeah, this is the look from the exhibition. So we show the older works in those uh, smaller screens on the on the wheels, and then there is a larger uh, screen uh, with the newer work in the background. And little, this is a little excerpt from the one screen version. excerpt from that one and then we got invited uh, uh, from uh, meets we got an invitation from meet center in Milan 
And they have this very large immersive room, so almost like this room, just a bit lower ceiling. And around the whole walls, they built 15 projectors so that they can, uh, can have this very wide panoramic uh, video on those walls. So, and we thought, okay, so we, we want to extend it and make it in, in a kind of more, ex more, more kind of immersive experience. So, so first we did the modeling, so 3D modeling to see how it kind of would kind of colorate with space. And, and this is image already from the actual installation. And then, uh, yeah, there are a bit more images from there. Uh, there, I will play a little bit also video documentation from this uh, uh, installation. So we, as you see, we played around with telescopes themselves. And also we used, this is the, actually the view from the radio telescope dish if you were inside, if you, if you are inside the dish. So it has this like boundaries around. So, and here is a small video documentation. I will just jump maybe to different stages so that you can get an impression.
<clears throat> yeah, that's uh, that's almost it. Just uh, summarizing, I would like to make a reference to uh, Yvonne Volkart. So she was also um, a lead leader of the Seco Media Aesthetics um, Research Project Group, and she just has published a wonderful book called Techno Ecologies. Oh, Ecologies of Care. Also, uh, there is she is writing about atmospheric forest. Um, and she was say, saying that eco-medial techniques have become intermediaries between worlds. So that's what she was saying also about atmospheric forest. That's what we can also say, how we work with the data and also with deep sensing. Yeah, so we are also publishing uh, the books uh, along our conferences uh, also. Well, but, uh, around our findings, uh, what we what we learn from our own artworks, and um, yeah, uh, Green revisited. I am also giving to Stephanie, so this book will be here. <laughs> this is covering your. Yeah, this is covering uh, uh, mainly COVID time festival editions uh, in Latvia, starting the Green Festival, continuing with Echo Data, and uh, finally with Post Sensorium. Uh, yeah, thank you. We can we can do it with one, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know about classes, that depends really on each of the universities, but uh, there are artist residency programs, which are at some of the uh, scientific institutes uh, or research sites. So I know there are a few uh, residency programs uh, which are particularly related to radio astronomy centers, but then like large, when you're large one, so there's a, this CERN Institute in Switzerland, so which deals with nuclear physics. Uh, but that's really kind of really, really hardcore science there, so which right. actually you have, uh, it's a, almost like a theoretical physics, so they're measuring, measuring uh, how particles uh, collide and, and, and what happens when they collide, so, but they have artist residency program there. So you just kind of, there are a few artists who've been there, so, and uh, I kind of can't really tell, so, from the top of my head, so, about the artworks. But I think that's, that's the way. Uh, I, I know also that there, um, one particular artist, a friend of ours, she had a residency program a while ago in California, but I'm not sure, so, which institution was that? So... This, this is the way I think how to kind of start with, to search around and then propose an art project or propose the idea, so not a kind of really, rather it goes, you, you show your portfolio and, and, and propose some kind of a concept or something, but depends yeah, on, on institution, but residencies yes, could be Yes, and if you are interested to work with biology, we have Paul Venus with Colesco Center here as well, yeah. so in your university. So. I had a question. I was thinking, actually, seeing your quote from Room of the Tour and uh, your Bible made me think of it. I wanted to ask you about the relationship between that, that early work with the antenna and the latter work with the forest. And I wanted, your, wanted you to see if to connect the two because for me it's just interesting because I think about with Galileo. 
It was kind of initially, I think, yeah, thanks for a very good question. So it was our try with the radio telescope uh, lately when we went there. So to try to see this, because also I see there is a kind of, it's a it's a big gap and it's a, a little bit also contradictory kind of uh, using these right like huge uh, space exploration technologies which are kind of sophisticated expensive and of course it drives like what is up there so this drives kind of our uh, curiosity and and interest and and I'm I'm not talking about kind of military background for those technologies that's a different kind of case. But from kind of romantic artist point of view, <laughs> so it kind of uh, engages my my sort of curiosity about where we are and what is up there and then how far it and, and so on and so on. All these questions, there is no answers to them. And at the same time, so going back to the Earth, what Bruno Latour particularly emphasizes, so that actually, so we we have to ca take care of of what's around us so very much, and and we have to explore more uh, how to kind of keep the equilibrium uh, which is so fragile here. And we saw there is this list contradictory. We started to talk with the scientists about it. We found out that they are very kind of focused on very particular things and they kind of are not really, uh, not trained, but kind of not used to uh, think in these terms so that kind of which, which kind of colorates. So we try to do it with, 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 the, with our work, but maybe it didn't go there uh, particularly uh, kind of talking about these things. But that's why, yeah, we still are thinking how to connect those, those both. So because there are these like huge uh, sites which are exploring uh, space and cosmos and at the same time, yeah. Yeah, we are asking ourselves why these two contradictory things interest us. Yeah, and I think maybe this is uh, this this new ni nice term, climate imagination. Maybe this is what artists do. So why not? Uh, yeah. So yeah, we are we should become very terrestrial. Yes, but that, but but I honestly will say this antenna is always attracting me. Well, why? You know. And then we were we were that that's why also this point cloud, by the way, became so ephemeral because we wanted to transform this antenna for us it's uh, because we have been thinking about antennas for really, really so long time so that's really a space on the earth where all these cosmic signals coming and meet yeah so that's that's why this is so fascinating so for our imagination and also that's why we wanted to turn this like a, a heavy uh, piece of metal into this uh, nearly like yeah invisible uh, point cloud, just a movement, like with some traces, like similar, similar uh, artistically, aesthetically similar to the, maybe this invisible signals which are coming uh, here to theirs. Yeah, we have uh, asked these questions to the scientists showing atmospheric forests, 
And uh, for them, then uh, the, the remote sensing guy, he was saying, oh, I'm almost jealous because this is, this is something uh, where, where, which I would like to see so that there is this structure yeah, and then also process is happening in it, like in a time scale. So it's a one uh, growing season which we are visualizing. There were about like 3,000 data, data rows so of about like four, it's about like 70 days. Yeah, so so it's all together many measurements. Uh, yeah, so so this is what they said, but about uh, about. Um, Radio astronomers, so they were really excited. Uh, we don't know, we didn't ask yet. Uh, but uh, so they, they were, because they really started to see the potential so that uh, their science uh, could be somehow delivered maybe for more understanding uh, through whatever we do, maybe. <laughs> Let's say maybe they were quite also open about it. Yeah, but um, they, they more like to talk anyway about black holes than about the climate on Earth. But with the... With the uh, bacteria battery project we had like several versions and we worked with particularly one biologist uh, for more kind of extended period of time and we found that he's even he's kind of even younger than us uh, he was very practically orientated so he was very excited if something worked as it is supposed to work uh, where he was not really interested in our sonifications <laughs> <laughs> kind of, uh, but when we set up, there's another one version of that installation. It's in Berlin in Futurium Museum, where three or six, six or four cells, I forgot, uh, are powering one electronic clock. So that worked, and for that he was really excited. So it's it's kind of there's a practical appliance for that. So it was he was happy about it. <laughs> So it just can vary, really different also from the person to person, so how, how they proceed. Yeah. It's an interesting question, so because uh, I think I've been thinking about that. Uh, but, uh, as more as I think about it, uh, as 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 uh, closer I get to conclusion that first of all I actually do it for myself. <laughs> so artists are kind of yeah, you know, it's it's uh, and also it's it's very difficult to sort of uh, because artist is kind of standalone performer. So you don't have the kind of researchers who research how you perceived it. Uh, you write it down and do my, my people do the research and then they come back and say, okay, this should be changed that way. If you want to achieve these goals, this, that should be changed that way. So artists don't have these kind of institutions in a way that don't do that. So I would say uh, it, it goes in a way that we, because we work also in a team and we work in collaboration with others. So it's pretty small circle uh, how we work and how we kind of discuss it and, and achieve what we kind of think about should be achievable. So then the rest is really in your hands. So I have no control of that. So no idea how what will happen. So whether you will receive it or not. So whether you leave the room, we will watch it. So yeah. I, I really. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, so. <laughs> no, but, yeah, but just to add, when you say, uh, yeah, because what interests us, yeah, personally, uh, that definitely is interesting many people. I mean, in this time, what we want to do, we want to show, yeah, 
our interest and our, how we see, how we, uh, uh, what is our perspective, what we find out interesting, and this is what we want to share with our work also about ecology, about uh, the science, about uh, these relations between the atmosphere and the terrestrial uh, ecosystems, for example. So, th so this is definitely, but, uh, but, but also, um, I think we are also at quite, uh, after this, really many slow years of working, um, we, are, we also have achieved uh, at the moment the point where suddenly also there is a bit flip happening with our own perception and, like, uh, and we start to, to show also the interest actually to try to understand how uh, this our work is perceived. Yeah, because before, we, especially with, uh, with bacteria battery, maybe it was not ne necessary because we also were thinking, is it uh, working, uh, how to sonify, so what's happening in invisible. But somehow with these works, uh, yeah, because of maybe of aesthetics, because of the potential how this immersive media are evoking uh, like some emotional response into the people, um, through especially VR, but that's already another thing. You are already embodied. So here we show the picture only, yeah. So uh, only aesthetics, but then you are embodied. So that's already a very different experience. All your body, you are kind of feeling. You, some people say that you, you nearly feel the smell of this forest, you know. So, so I think this is something again a new, th new field for us. Uh, where we are just at the moment uh, trying to, yeah, to also research, so we feel more already in the side of research with, with your question. Yeah, however, so I just thought there's another part of us which, which Russ mentioned in the beginning, so we are curating uh, festivals. And within a framework of these art festivals, there we actually become more rational. So we, we think, so what we want to achieve, because yeah. each festival has a certain theme, uh, we invite uh, people to participate, artists participate, also uh, people giving talks at the festival. So there we kind of really uh, thinking rationally, so how to achieve it and, and what we want to achieve with, with each particular edition of the festival. So we, maybe it compensates. <laughs> because, it's more e because it's more easy to, to, to make these decisions, also aesthetic and dramaturgy of the space uh, about other people's work than about your own. Yeah. Uh, what was it that sparked your interest in this art form in the younger years? Uh, say it again. Uh, what was it that sparked your interest in this art form in the younger years? Oh, oh. Mm. Mm. What was that? What, was spark, what sparked your interest in, 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 in this art form? So, probably, uh, I think when we go really back, so in 90s, when we started to work together, uh, that was the kind of special period of time. So when, when Iron Curtain broke down, Soviet system broke down, our country got independent, and uh, internet medium uh, came, became available to everybody, to us also in the West, in the East. So, and we kind of met with, with many interesting artists and people who were really kind of communication hungry at that time. And from one side there were people, and from the other side there was this new uh, digital technology which started to emerge as a tool, because we are classically trained. So we know how to paint, we know how to draw. We are classically uh, trained to do a uh, classical drawing or painting. Uh, we can draw portraits of figure or, or paint it, so not anymore because we have lost maybe, maybe some of those, maybe but I need to kind of <laughs> bring it back. But technology was something absolutely new for us. So, and because of these possibilities of uh, being connected with others uh, in different other places, so that probably was the trigger. And then afterwards it just goes and different directions yeah, until until the about like two about 2017 when you brought this first VR our VR set so this is then we finally had an interest also in 3d with uh, this uh, aesthetics just because it was possible something like photogrammetry these point clouds because before um, this aesthetics which was 20 years ago of 3d was not really yeah triggering us
I, I think so, yes. Uh, if I, it's difficult to analyze you, yourself, but I think yes, because it trains your sense of proportions, trains your sense of, uh, like many things. So the composition, the whole composition, whether it's a spatial or it's a flat uh, in, in a frame, so it trains this sense, which kind of then just, you have it. So you kind of don't ex kind of analyze it anymore. You see it, either it's there or not. And that kind of training has been very useful, yeah. It's expensive, I think, to run them, so that's the thing. But uh, we had this chance in 2001, uh, when we went to the site of Radio Telescope. There's a Marco Pelchan artist who said this kind of quote also, which I mentioned, so that we are now in this gray zone when militaries have left and scientists haven't arrived yet. So, and that was possible to do it. So the Radio Telescope, it functions now, but it's now it's uh, expensive, to, you can hire it. Uh, they, they can kind of point it to certain whatever direction. You can get the data, but you have to pay for the time. Uh, if it's abandoned, um, yeah, that's the question, like how to kind of make it being functional or, or who owns it, and, and it's each case is different, I think. Yeah, and I think they just, uh, the future of these antennas, it's, this is still working 24-7. Uh, more than ever, <laughs> but actually it's not for long because mainly they are shutting down these old 70s, uh, 1970s antennas in uh, all other places. And also this one will be, so they have a new arrays which are much more effective also already built also there in these windspills. But they are not beautiful. <laughs> However, in Switzerland I just heard so near where you have your research institute, there is also an array of antennas They are transmitting uh, football games, soccer games. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting how you're thinking about how um, technologies expire and how that creates a need for art, and especially digital art and new media. Um, but as digital art and new media expire, where do you think that can, um, I don't know. Biology, maybe. There? Biology, I think. We are here still embodied and, and, and I, I believe that actually this sort of could go there because still digital, it's, it's very kind of hardware based very much. And it's still very, even if it's kind of immaterial in a, in a, in a way, still there is a huge kind of materiality behind it. So the, the server farms and so on. And uh, I, yeah, uh, also even talking about but that's kind of futuristic in a way, so I don't know where it will go, but uh, VR headsets are too clumsy, too heavy, and, and too difficult to kind of use them for like, for like feature film. That could be really difficult to use it. So it is so heavy and, and, and so difficult so that you get tired of it. So it's still too much of gear. So I think, yeah, it's... It's still good for art. <laughs> Short. <laughs> A short time. <clears throat> okay. Last call for questions. Last call. All right. Well, let's give another round of applause. <laughs> Have a lovely break, everyone, and we'll see you back here for <laughs> No, it's the same. <laughs> Software update. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. You saw it, right? But that was the software. Oh, okay. I just.
wanted no. to make sure if you no. weren't getting hacked or something. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Hour 20. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got some great questions. So so. Yeah, it was really good. So I appreciate so yeah. Very good questions. Yeah. Yeah. What is he studying? Um, he's, he's only in high school. I think he's in high school. Yeah, he's doing art.